I work on these episodes very, very slowly because I'm essentially a pauper and I do all this stuff myself and I'm not very good at it. And it seems like every time I finish writing something up for this game, it gets a huge patch that fundamentally changes how the game works and renders my opinion obsolete. It happened a couple months ago when they rejiggered the health values and TOD stuff. It happened before that when they added a couple of characters and so on and so forth. But at some point I have to put something out or else I'll be stuck waiting until this game's development is officially concluded. Right now I'm writing this part of the episode in May 2020 and rumor has it that a major rework of the game is underway. If this rework actually happens, I won't even let this sentence finish before. Anyway, Battle for the Grid is a 2D fighting game based on the Power Rangers series. It was made by a developer named Enway, and its format is 3v3 with active tagging, where you make a team of three characters and one fights on point while the other two wait off screen, occasionally hopping in to swap places or act as an assist. What really stands out to me about this game is that it's very lean. Look at this control scheme. Let's ignore this tag stuff for a bit. You've got three buttons for normals, one for specials, one for each assist, and double button presses for all the other solo moves. Dashing, EX moves, supers, and the big flashing mechanic, activating one of the Megazords, those signature combining robots, and throwing a giant hitbox onto the screen with the press of a button until its juice runs out. There are character-specific attack chains, which either link into the same strength button like light into light, or into increasing strengths like light into medium into heavy, and most characters can mix and match the two types of change up to certain points. Nothing new here, but nothing too frustrating either, unless you're one of those people who can't stand chains with unique normals. Inputs for special moves use one button and a direction. You press the special button on the ground or in the air, or you press the special button in one of two directions, forwards or backwards. There are no varying degrees of strengths for these moves, and very few of them have variations with different properties and drawbacks between them. You get one move that does at least one thing. EX attacks are technically also special moves, but the turn doesn't work the same way as it does in most games, where you spend part of the super meter to pump up a pre-existing move. Instead, you press light attack and special, and only light attack and special, and your character performs their EX. These attacks are usually unique moves with special properties that play a specific role in the character's combo structure or options in neutral. And I want you to stick a pin in that idea because I want to come back to that one later. It's a very standardized control scheme, aside from the part with the robots, that matches a lot of other fighting games. Thing is, there's space in this control scheme to add more inputs. Enway could have added strengths to moves, or a traditional EX move system, by adding stuff like traditional rolling inputs or multiple button press inputs like medium special, hard special, all three buttons in special, and so on. But they didn't. You get the one move, which might do a little or a lot, depending on its properties and how you use the active tag system. They're not duplicated to add something different to each version, or to add little execution checks and fail states by messing with inputs that have more points of failure. For better or worse, when a move is implemented, when it's put in the game, and when it's changed, the whole move is tweaked in one go. And that's a common thing. Plenty of games have specials that don't have multiple strengths or use one button and so on. But it's straightforward, and while I know nothing about programming, I assume that balancing one move, or a move and a version of said move that's tied to an assist, is much simpler than balancing the same move in duplicate, triplicate, or quadruplicate. And balancing is key, because we now live in a time where the very idea of a separate updated release is met with resistance. The only time a named update is accepted from Jump is when the initial release is so poorly executed, so flawed, that people are left begging for a do-over. To avoid this, more and more developers add new stuff onto existing games through downloadable content, whether they call them seasons, or updates, or whatever, and some take the extra step to make a physical release of the new content, but that's not necessary in most cases. Results have varied. Some games flourish every time new content is added or adjustments are made, 
while others struggle with top-heavy rosters, redundant additions, retroactively redundant newcomers, power creep, a combination of these problems, or even more problems on top of that. Battle for the Grid is in a sweet spot right now. Blinking dash cancels notwithstanding. Partially due to its 3v3 format. Enway's completed two seasons in the past, and as of this writing, they're ramping up their third season. Each season adds about three new characters, originally in groups, but lately they've come out one at a time over the course of a few months. And three characters are enough to make a full team. But because the new additions haven't overlapped too much with the existing roster up to this point, they all add something to team composition. In addition, Season 2 has added a Megazord and Season 3 will probably add another one, and in addition to all of that other stuff, Enway updates the game regularly. If there's a glitch or an infinite or a console's version starts glitching out or something else works out differently than what they expected, it tends to get patched out quickly for better or worse. As a player, without any input from the staff, I get the impression that the staff has an idea of how they want the game to look and function, and they act pretty quickly on it. This will lead to stuff like, for example, plinking inputs or very simple loops getting patched out, or cancels getting added to moves to make them more useful. This can be frustrating for players who like the stuff that gets patched out, and it's tempting to play armchair director and pick apart every change that gets made. On the other hand, the fact that the game is updated so often makes some players tolerate stuff that they would otherwise not put up with, such as the aforementioned glitches and infinites, because, hey, if it's really bad, it'll get patched out. Like, I'm well aware that Battle for the Grid uses hit stun decay and juggle limits instead of a hard infinite prevention system, but because it started out as a one touch on your dead game, and the more egregious stuff gets patched out sooner rather than later, I don't really care. It's still a valid criticism, but I personally don't care. That said, reading the patch notes for a game is not the same as actually playing the game. I think the game has a lot to offer in itself, mainly in its tag system. Tags, called takeovers in this game, are active. You can press the assist button and as the character teleports in from the top of the screen, you can press it again to take active control of the assist. Or you can do it during the assist's move, or even after the assist's move, so long as the assist isn't actively teleporting away. Playing around with takeovers is the most fun part of this game for me. It's not new, but out of all the games with active tags I've seen, it's my favorite version so far. The game uses limited combo states, i.e. only one ground pounce per combo, one wall bounce, two launchers, etc, etc. And takeovers won't reset those limits or anything like that. Hell, each character can only tag in once, like every other tag game out there. But they add enough variety to almost make up for those limited states. It also works pretty well on defense, as a near instantaneous teleport with very little recovery lets you swap your characters around very quickly, and characters who aren't on screen gradually heal some damage. Just like, again, in most other tag games. Now, you can't just dance all over people with block strings. Characters that are blocking can push block pretty much anything by pressing the special button during block stun, and that'll shove the attacking character away from the defending character, even if the attacking character isn't making direct contact. Projectiles or distended hitboxes are still vulnerable to it, and while the character using the push block is stuck in block stun for about 10 frames, the block stun is cleared on the 10th frame, and the defending character can make a move afterwards. But this is where Battle for the Grid has a blatant execution check. Most 2D games with push blocking maps it to normal buttons, and pressing down back to block prevents those buttons from being used, at least in proximity. Mistiming a push block in Battle for the Grid will usually cause players on defense to use a special move instead, which leaves them vulnerable to whiff punishes or other things, unless they're using Gen, whose mispress will probably register as 4S, which will probably throw out a projectile that'll linger off screen menacingly for a second or two. So it's not that Battle for the Grid lacks execution checks, but that it shifts them around a bit. The typical mind games apply here. Staggered attack strings, the 25, 25, 25, 25 mix up between low attacks, slow overheads, instant jumping overheads, and empty jump shenanigan. Along with the added threat of a delayed takeover that forces you to either shift where you're looking at or eat an embarrassingly basic mix up. The lifeblood of Jason players everywhere. Actually, if I've learned anything from Dragon Ball Fighters, it's that people can't sleep at night without knowing that a rushdown focused subgenre like tag fighting games has a robust suite of defensive options. So I'll talk about the other ones as well. 
Players can also force characters on the opposing team to tag in by smacking the point character out with a swap strike, performed by pressing down the special button and an assist button. It's got a little bit of invincibility at the start of its animation. It usually starts up pretty fast, it's safe on block, and it counts as a special move, which means that you can cancel it from normal attacks. The assist slot you press determines which character on the opponent's side is brought in. It's basically the snapback from the Marvel vs. series, a mechanic that's been getting more play lately, which I'm glad to see. It costs one segment of the super meter, the same as an EX move, and half as much as the supers in this game. And in the current patch, a successful swap strike takes a segment from your opponent's nifty new Megazord gauge. This new gauge now regulates the use of Megazords, which I mentioned earlier. In previous versions of Battle for the Grid, Megazords could only be used if you were down a member of your team. The more people you've lost, the more time it stays active, and you could only command a Megazord once. The way it was explained to me, it was supposed to be the comeback mechanic, the hype bringer. One person even said it was like a fourth member of the team, although he got smacked for that comment. Not by me though, never me, I'm a good boy. It definitely made comebacks possible, but I don't know if it was ever considered hype. Although to its credit, it's like a less annoying version of Patsuman's level 3 from Tatsunoko vs Capcom. In any case, now Megazords are attached to this gauge with three segments. The activation is the same, you press both assists, but now you need at least two segments of this gauge to make it work, and using three segments allows the Megazord to stay active longer. You can call Megazords as often as you can afford them now, even if your team still has all three members on board. The Megazord meter is gained based on how much damage your team takes as a percentage of your team's total overall health, so teams with a member disadvantage will still have more chances to call their Megazord but the actual course of the match has a much bigger effect on the team's resources to begin with. The game doesn't necessarily have to turn into a scramble when players are on their last character with a level 2 Megazord summon waiting in the wings. It will, because people always forget to use snapbacks in any games that they exist in, but now it doesn't have to, at least theoretically. And before I go on, I just want to say how much I appreciate how well all this stuff fits together with the look of the game. I mean, it's based on a series that emphasizes friendship, teamwork, and how cool toys are to play with, so that naturally lends itself to a team-based fighting game. But specifically using that bitrate teleportation, having characters catch a breather off-screen, having them pop in from off-screen to make that clutch save or pointlessly get cut down, that really matches the flow and the look of Power Rangers, and to an extent Super Sentai, although it's clearly skewed more towards the Power Ranger side of things, including that comic series that I'm only vaguely aware of. Hey, I read one issue. Cut me some slack. Okay, back again to the actual gameplay here. I like the look and mechanics of the game. If I didn't, I would have made an episode on it. But I feel like the initial roster was a bit too reserved. Characters from the initial roster were efficient and they had just enough variety the game needed for team composition, but their moves lacked impact. Fighting games need characters that either look cool or do cool stuff, and while those are subjective concepts, they determine who comes flocking to the game. I like Power Rangers as much as the next guy, so that was enough for me to take a look, but I didn't look twice at Battle for the Grid until Zed was added, and he brought those double knee, staff swinging, putty summoning, off-screen, hit crab, nonsense combos with him. I think the roster additions have gotten better and better over time, but I don't blame anyone who's passed on the game based on early impressions. What I personally appreciate about the whole roster is that each character's key moves are interesting, even if they overall lack the oomph that you'd want, although the game was patched to include more effects and that kind of helps. They've got moves that are inspired from other games, but the ones that make their extended combo structures work tend to be somewhat original and interesting. Tommy's dropkick, Dracon's teleports, Zed's knees, Cinezoic's power-ups and stuns, it's all solid stuff. The EX moves that the characters have pull double duty here since they're the moves that carry that extra impact and they're usually the moves that you use in longer combos to bring the opponents into that sweet spot where you can cancel into a super move. Except for Mastodon Sentry since his super move is a counter that never activates when you use it in a combo, which is, you know, it's fair. But you could let it be used in a combo, it, it would be fine. It's why the super meter is in three neat segments after all. It's built for that EX into super cancel. You don't have to follow that combo structure, mind you, and assists give you enough flexibility to go into and out of different combo paths. But having that set structure gives you an idea of what a combo that's good enough to practice looks like without necessarily looking up stuff online. 
which can be something that's hard to get a grasp of in tag games with high damage. You should be looking for stuff online though. There's no excuse for ignoring info when it's right at your fingertips. Right now, Battle for the Grid is in a good place. The roster's size and the tag system's flexibility are good enough to encourage team composition, although there's still some pretty cheesy stuff that makes the game obnoxious. The major concern I have about it is how the game is going to pan out when the updates are done. If people find the final result interesting on its own, then it'll last, but if the only incentive players have to play is that carrot of new content being dangled in front of them, then it'll only get more frustrating as the game's framework starts to show its age. That's a criticism that I'm basically copy-pasting from every fighting game that's come out this gen because it applies to all modern fighting games. I like this new era of long-term support, but I don't like the idea of games getting so top-heavy and obtuse that people who missed out on them in the beginning have a generational gap of learning to make up for. Whether it's because of new gimmicks, or extra characters that cheat the underlying rules of the game, or any other number of issues that could happen. Battle for the Grid has avoided issues like that up to this point, but that could change at any time. I just really hope it doesn't. Better luck next time.